we are doing another podcast and we'll talk about Myanmar. And this is our research interest as well. So I've got Robert, uh, I, I always struggle with your surname, Dumitri. Dumitri, yeah, that is perfect. So Robert Dumitri is my research student, so hopefully a PhD student. So hopefully. Uh, we have quite a lot of funding, so fingers crossed. We'll get one of them. <laughs> we shall see. Or we'll just go mad if you don't get it. <laughs> we'll, yep. we'll go for hunger strike. One of the things I always ask, like, you know, about a bit of background, tell us, you know, your childhood memories, where, where you grew up a bit. Uh, so I grew up in Romania. Uh, the first probably eight, eight, nine years of my life I spent uh, in the city. However, then my parents decided to move to the countryside and I spent about 10 years at the countryside. I lived um, there with my parents and my brother. Then I, uh, once I finished high school back home in Romania, I decided to come to Scotland to continue my studies. I took a gap year, um, which I, uh, I it, it was a very good decision to do that. And following my gap year, um, I started the university. Uh, I did my degree at the University of Dundee um, and my master's, uh, same place. Spent my third academic year in Grenoble. Uh, I did visit Paris, though. Uh, I spent, as I was saying, I spent my third academic year at Sciences Po Grenoble in France, um, and I studied at one of the most prestigious uh, political institutions in France. It was a very good experience. I also got to meet a lot of people and improve my French, which is always a good thing. I mean, you, you had a proper degree with French, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I did French as part of my degree. So yeah, I can write and speak. <laughs> <laughs> because like one of my favorite things, like favorite pastime is like watching French films, the classic ones, you know? As yeah. a, France is very good in like, you know, art, culture, and like obviously the filmmaking. One of the things we are talking about, about Romania is like this like Trans, Transylvania, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of the famous, well, it's a famous region, mostly for uh, various associations with Bran Castle, which is also known as Dr Dracula's Castle. Mm, uh, whenever I heard about this, like Hotel Transylvania and all those things, I yeah. honestly think it's like fictitious town or fictitious hotel, yeah. but it's actually a real place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's very real. Uh, I would totally recommend you visit throughout the summer because we have lovely weather. Mm. Um, I've been there, I've been, I visited Brown Castle, um, I don't know, three, four years ago, I think four years ago. It was pretty nice. Um, yeah, it's, it's very well known and there's a lot of tourists. I, th I think so that, that would be, give us some kind of, you know, good background understanding about us, ourselves. Uh, and, and I think uh, you, you worked with me closely with a couple of things. We wrote a bunch of articles for the conversation. Um, and like Myanmar is, is one of our, you know, really focus area. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a kind of ongoing thing, you know. Obviously, the, one of the group, which is like Rohingya people, our serious research interest, and they're still living, uh, you can call it like the largest, biggest refugee camp in the world right now. Yeah. So 1.2 million people. Uh, so that's like 2017. That's the like biggest exodus from their country. So obviously they were, you know, their citizenship stripped off in 1982. Uh, no, they lost everything basically. So that's the start of the end. And then by 2017, more or less, they decided that yeah, okay, let's finish it. Yeah, it's 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 shocking. Um, yeah, when you look at the history of the Rohingya, it's really interesting to see how. The relationships between them and uh, and Myanmar and the government evolved throughout time, um, and it's it's quite sad to like realize that in our in our days we get to like we get to live with uh, 
with the thought of other people being murdered and slaughtered, really. Mm -hmm. um, just because they happen to be different. Obviously, uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot going on, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because like, I think you, you came from Romania and I, I came from Bangladesh. I think we both have some kind of you know, bad political history as well. So yeah. we witnessed some of the violences in our, like in my personal life, you know. So I was very young when the, you know, the independence happened. Like my family suffered. So it's like it started from British rule and then ended up with like the Pakistan's rule and then, you know, got some independence and then here we are. Uh, but it's still, it's a, it's a long way to go to this, you know, this ultimate, what do you call like nirvana, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Romania had, uh, where, where we lived under communism until the revolution, which was in 1989. Um, I don't have direct memories from that era because I wasn't even born, but obviously my parents and my grandparents have told me lots of stories about the communism era in Romania and the fight to, to, to the fight for democracy that followed and the, basically the transitioning process from communism to democracy, which wasn't as straightforward as it people expect, but that's everywhere else. And the way we, we are taught about history, about our past, it looks like, you know, even like people like Francis Fukuyama, when he was, you know, writing his The End of History, and you know, talked about, you know, liberal democracy, that's it. We want it. You know, we'll be all fine. <laughs> we'll all eat McDonald's and then, you know, go for... Starbucks coffee, and then, you know, we'll have fun. This, this idea about this, like, linear, you know, world history, um, it's not true. No, I think, I think every country that's gone through a transition to democracy has had a, quite a bumpy road, and there's a lot of um, effort, and people have to constantly, constantly uh, make changes and commit to ch actual changes rather than superficial. Yeah, let's call ourselves a democratic country because we just have free elections. But what's the meaning of those free elections? Are they actually free? Is mm -hmm. it actually the results taken into account? Are all the minorities involved in the, mm -hmm. in the election process? And this is just one thing. Mm -hmm. When you talk about you know, the, the pinnacle of democracies, mm -hmm. like the USA or the, the yeah. <laughs> Great Britain, I mean... Um, and we kind of witnessed these democracies as well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, by living here or learning about their histories through books, articles. Uh, these are all, you know, proper scholarly pieces of works. Um, yeah, Every, we can't, I don't think there's a place in the world where you can say that, oh, they have, they have the democratic idea has been attained or anything like that. I think it's just a, an ongoing endeavor towards mm. making sure that democracy, the democracy is as um, accurate or, you know, if the principles are mm. Um, mm. there, you know. I mean, I mean, especially with this, like, you know, this Black Lives Matter in America, I mean, the society is totally fractured. I mean, especially in the last few years, and suddenly, you know, it looks like Serious number of people are really not happy. They call it their country, but it looks like whose country? Whose country it is? I mean, uh, and then everyone is saying that you know the country should belong to them, or you know uh, all those all those historical misunderstanding about their ownership of their countries. Lots of conflictual information as well. Uh, oh, so yeah. Kind of like thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So the, the Marxist idea about, you know, uh, so I quite like this, 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 this dialectic idea about the society's progress. I think this, this conflictual events happening the last couple of years, it will create some kind of progress, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's, that's part of this emancipation process. Uh, but it's, it, it's yeah. not easy. It's not easy. Oh, no, no, it's not easy. And I think, it, it, as I said, it requires effort. And it requires commitment um, to making sure that everyone is involved, uh, all the minorities are involved, people's voices are heard, and mm. you know it's it's not an easy thing. America's independence is in like seventeen seventy six. Yeah. Then they they thought that yeah we got it man, <laughs> got it. <now. laughs> yeah. 
it's yeah, still, like it's, it's still they haven't got it, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I think I think democracy ultimately it's 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 an it's like the, we all have the democratic ideal, but we can't. It's just it's more like a process, or this is how I see it. Lots of problem areas, isn't it? And then if you compare this with like Myanmar situation, the yeah. Myanmar history started basically, you know, in the 1950s. Well, if you see the bigger picture, I mean, it's it's very different. But I also think that the country's understanding of democracy uh, differs really, because uh, like in Myanmar, for instance, like people's uh, ideas of democracy are probably and understanding of democracy may be different because than ours. You know, we think of equality, mm. whereas they think of equality. Maybe in the same way, however, they, they still don't think that, oh, Rohingya maybe should be included. You know, they are as equal as we are, because this is what one of the principles of democracy. So, I, like, it's, it's interesting to look at how every country, nation, um, interprets. Like, when you look into Aung San Suu Kyi's endeavor, early on in her fight, you know, everyone thought that she would be the person that would bring democracy and human rights to Myanmar. To like, to the extent that we as Western nation, nations, we expect it. So, you know, when you, if you look at her bias to begin with, then she would say, you would say, yeah, maybe her. But then if you look at what she did, when she actually managed to like, be, when, when she started being in power and she had the power to change the Myanmar society and everything, so and so forth, she did no longer do it. Even with her father, that you know, found mm-hmm. father of Myanmar, Aung San. Yeah. I mean, his life was quite problematic as well. He was all over the places. He was the yeah. founding member of the Communist Party. He was the nationalist leader. He's the founding father of Myanmar Army. And then just before the independence, he was assassinated by his own people. The country like you know, Myanmar, where like I think 135 minority groups, isn't it? Yeah. And like, the main groups are like, if you see the map, I can see the yeah, map. Yeah, there's like eight, eight main minority groups. Yeah. The top is like Kachin, and then on the left is Shin, and then Arakanis. And if you go to the right side, you can see the Shan people, and then um, Karini people, and the Karen people. So these are like the main groups who have been fight over the years. If you look at the, the independence movement in Myanmar, it's just like a you know, bunch of people decided more or less everything for everyone. Uh, and one of the story I always tell this, you know, this like 30 comrades. It's quite a fascinating story, isn't it? So the Aung San was the leader. So Aung San Suu Kyi's father, Aung San, was the leader for these 30 comrades who actually, during the Second World War, they left Myanmar to get training yeah. in China and then ended up like with like Japanese military and they trained there for six months and then they actually came back with the Japanese army. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and basically they invaded their own country. <laughs> yeah, I think I think one of the one of the biggest grievances uh, of the of Aung An- San was uh, like basically, he wanted to liberate the country from the Brit- British, because quite often the British would um, would choose uh, people amongst the ethnic minorities for their positions. Like there is evidence uh, where where it says that the British choose even like Rohingya people for certain positions uh, instead of the Burmese, which created tensions between obviously the majority, the Burmese majority, and certain ethnic minorities. Uh, and so, and so they felt that they felt like they need they needed to um, to create their own identity and to assert this identity to the world as Burman. And I think he, he with uh, one of his um, one of his friends, uh, Utan, I think, mm. um, they created a movement, the Tankin movement, where they wanted to like emphasize what they saw as the the Burmese race. And they wanted to create this identity and portray it to the world, uh, just because just because they felt they were that they weren't respected by the British, and they wanted they felt like they were um, they had to have their own identity respected. 
mm. you know. And I think this this uh, rationale basically pushed them to try and you know liberate the country from the British and seek uh, advice initially from the Chinese, but they, as you said, they ended up with the Japanese uh, mm. military mm. invaded their own country with this Japanese force. Mm-hmm. And then they are thinking that, oh, okay, <laughs> there is a problem here. Yeah. Uh, what should we do now? And then I think the consensus was, let's fight against the fascist fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think in 1943, they, they joined the Allies and they started fighting against, <laughs> against the Japanese. Uh, so obviously, you know, um, these freedom fighters, these like 30 comrades, so their understanding about, you know, Japan's rule, um, you know, they were thinking of it will be a benign rule, then they will help us and then get rid of, you know, British rule. So this, this idea about, you know, that That's dream, the, ideal. the ideal situation. <laughs> so they ended up with like fighting the both groups, those kind of moments, which created this idea about, you know, this kind of nationhood. And suddenly they felt that this is it. And, and people sacrificed their lives as well. In my own country, in Bangladesh, when it got independence from Pakistan, it was not easy. Mm-hmm. You know, came from almost like three million people died there. Independence is always has got a big price to pay. Like if you go back to like Aung San's own life, I mean, um, it's, it's quite I don't know, like lots of like topsy turvy journey, isn't it? So he was mm-hmm. supposed to go to China, get training. He ended up going to Japan. Yep. <laughs> got trained by that, you know, Japanese force <laughs> and yeah. came back and then, you know, thought that, yeah, let's fight against the British rule. And then suddenly found, found that, oh, it's not the British rule. It's the Japanese invasion yeah. more problem than actually mm-hmm. the British rule. So ended up with like another fight there. And then, you know, they <laughs> got rid of, you know, first Japan and then, you know, as some kind of, compromise position with the British rule that, okay, they are leaving very soon. And suddenly he got assassinated. I mean, what the hell this came from? I mean, Yeah, like, it would be very interesting uh, and very rewarding to know what actually happened. Why was he assassinated? Then by mm-hmm. whom? Precisely, but mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. We but, can only speculate. But one thing is very clear, because he was a very young man, isn't he? He's like only 32. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, it looks like by that time he was he was a leader. All those subsequent people we saw, who became like Myanmar's, you know, prime ministers or you know, military head, all actually part of the thirty comrades. Even like Nevin, the first army general, yeah. he was part of the thirty comrades. Was actually working under Aung San. So you know, so obviously he has got he had something something very special. Um, yeah, probably charisma is one of the things because he inspired a lot of people to join him mm, in the fight of, mm. um, in the fight for independence. And yeah, I think he was a, like his strategy, like didn't know any boundaries, uh, and his endeavor was just he had one scope, and that's independence. And basically, he got that uh, with he paid for that with a mm. big price, but. Mm. I think he was quite unsettled, isn't it? So, you know, growing up a country in a country where it was occupied by another, you know, powerful, you know, colonial ruler. So this young man was looking for some kind of, like, you know, the future for his own life and and the people around him. He thought that, yeah, I can lead. I can, you know. I think I remember I, I remember reading the fact that uh, whilst he was at university, he noticed that a lot of the university structured in the within the leadership of the university, there was a lot of um, like British Indian uh, figures, and he would get like this is what pushed him to try and like we could we could be our own we could be our own people or our own masters. You know, we have we have an identity. We are Burman. Like, why should we be led by these people or these people? Mm. Um, so we are still staying in that, you know, 1940s, 50s. So, so basically, so we, we got the independence and then Aung San is gone. Um, so the new group of people, you know, came to the forefront and they more or less 
started this new country, new nation. So like l- that first 10 years was very tricky. It's obviously lots of things happening around them. The China just like, you know, became a communist country. It's just the next door. So obviously there's lots of pressure there. Uh, and then India, Pakistan, and obviously their own problem with those, all those ethnic groups within their own country. So lots of things to, you know, take care of. Yeah, and I think there was quite a lot of tensions amongst uh, like certain ethnic groups, which brought a lot of instability, which led the prime minister at the time, uh, Unu, try and transfer the, uh, the power to a caretaker government. And this is where Newin basically got um, started being in charge for, mm-hmm. I think, two years from 58 to 60. Problem is, I think... Without Aung San, it was difficult. Yeah, yeah. They lost their leader. Basically, I think. And then, which created lots of problems for other good people around Aung San. Yeah. Uh, it looks like the earliest group, people who were in this like anti-fascist alliance, mm-hmm. uh, some of the people were excluded from this like new country's leadership. Uh, mm-hmm. because they thought that they are too leftist to you know socialist or you know the thinking too much about the workers right and the strike and all those things so all those people were excluded and it kind of made sense that in 1953 more or less the communist party in burma became illegal yeah, yeah. So, so that's one thing is gone so like Aung San is gone <laughs> communist <laughs> party is gone <laughs> so you know the the country was you know, the thinking about this like socialist idea, equal society, problem with these minority rights. So when these things are happening, it looks like, you know, those things will be a problem. Oh, yeah. So I think they were struggling in the very beginning. And then that this opportunity in 1958 to have this kind of caretaker government by the army. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. the army said that, okay, we are coming here, but for just for a short term, uh, we'll, you know, more or less make sure that there's an election. There was an election. And then that, like, pe- people like Uno came back again with the election, with a landslide victory. But the problem is, army just, you know, just the, tested the blood of the power. And then they thought that, yeah, no, forget our election. We are mm-hmm. back. And that's yeah. the, 1962, that's the start of this, like, brutal army rule. So that, like, one of the 30 comrades, this Ney win more or less mm-hmm. the army chief, and then now the head of the state. In charge of, yeah. 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 And I think, I think he um, established the first Union Revolu- Revolutionary Council um, that also laid the way to establish the Burmese way to socialism. Mm-hmm. And they also um, established the Burmese Socialist Program Party, which, uh, well, well, through which they tried to like organize the country and lay out the principle upon which uh, the country will more or less run, but not very successful, probably. Mm. Well, this is quite interesting. Like, lots of dictators around the world, they, they use the word socialism, socialism quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> which has got nothing to do with like socialism. It sounds like always like to me is like Holy Roman Empire, which is uh, neither holy nor Roman. Uh, but they yeah. call it it was so bad. I mean, you know, like in the, uh, what's called this, like 40 years war, they almost like wiped out half of the Germans' population. So the holiness is, you know. Debatable, arguable. But they they, they love those words, you know, like socialism, holy, you know, like all those big idea about democracy. Yeah, I think think Nevin tried to implement, well, at least in theory, his uh, socialist, like socialist elements, um, I think he banned the, all the political parties. That was in 1974, because, you know, there are some, some political parties, you know, saying we want some yeah. election again. No. And in 1974, I think Nevin was really angry and said, okay, do you know what? No, no way. Party, one party country. Safe. Yeah. Forget about that, you know, so that's it. Yeah. He also, I think he cut off ties with everyone else around. So he basically isolated himself as much as he could. He's not 
a fan of Buddhism either, because you know, so Buddhism, the real Buddhism talks about you know the humanity, the you know non-violence, and all those good things. Um, yeah. This army was doing lots of violence, you know, so it doesn't fit in. So when yeah, but... a talks about Buddhism, army was you know has got their own idea about Buddhism. Yes, but also I think it's important to say that Buddhism also conferred any political party with sort of legitimacy. And people had, obviously, their religion played a big part in their lives, of the, in the lives of the majority Burmese. Mm. So it was, it was basically a handy thing to have. It's it, it, it almost like the Buddhism is like hardwired with this like Burmese nationhood, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. a very cultural thing. It's not only religion. Is the cultural yeah. identity is is yeah. their, you know, thing that you know we are, bummer people and you know, uh, yeah. unite us is this Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. And we are good people, and that thing was kind of part and parcel of you know, like that that particular society. But I think over the years, you know, the, obviously British rule and the Japanese invasion, and then you know the small, kind of democratic kind of idea post independence. Myanmar, mm-hmm. and then suddenly the army. And I think you know, those good memories, those good ideas about, you know, so society, it's like the body politic of, of the country, isn't it? The body politic of the country is like hardwired with all those good ideas about Buddhism, about you know, sacrificing things for other people's you know, well-being. So all those things were there. But I think with the continuous brutality, the historical brutality, that start with like this like British rule and the Japanese invasion, and then the army with full force for the next 50 years will see that brutal, brutal rule. More or less, you know, convince people that, you know what, life's tough, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, don't, don't be, you know, too excited about, you know, all those good ideas about life, you know? No, I've got a gun. You know, so if you don't behave, we'll shoot. That's, that's the big chunk of their history. Yeah. So basically that overrode the ideal Burmese society. They basically created a narrative that like, suited the, the military regime so that they, they, they just, uh, um, through this narrative, they managed to like, create divisions amongst people in the society and create and create enough um enough story enough power to their story so that they can get away with pretty much everything because this is what basically happened also like the inciting those political problems in the periphery you know with other groups of people like the shan people the kachi mm-hmm. people or Japanese, um and then telling the people that you know, we are fighting yeah for yeah. the safety of your lives and yeah. you know, the well-being of this country, the one country, one unit. I yeah. think they needed conflicts to to to. They needed conflicts to uh, justify their place there, the military regime's place in the society. Because I believe that um, to a certain extent, they used the Rohingya for the same mm. for the same thing. They created a conflict which justified the country's need of them being. Uh, leading the country because obviously you couldn't, they created this picture where, you know, the Rohingya created chaos. So they needed someone to respond to that chaos. Otherwise it would have spread even more, you know, mm. which is completely inaccurate, but, mm. you know, they, they created all of these narratives so that, you know, um, the Burmese would increasingly agree with the fact that they needed the military junta there. That's a historical problem with any dictators because I mean, normally what they do is try to pick the weakest oh yeah in yeah. the society and then use it as a kind of prop for the rest of the society that you know these people look, are, at, them. look at them these people are not like us you know they are the problem yeah. troublemaker if you can yeah. get them then we'll have you know peace here <laughs> Yeah, and I think it was easy for the military regime to pick the Rohingya because one, it was a target of convenience because they were, they were the weakest. Um, there were other like other ethnic minorities they, that um, opposed the regime violently, but Rohingya couldn't do that. 
because they didn't have the resources. Mm. And they were also different physically. They looked different than the rest of the, of the country, you know. Okay. So it was an easy target to pick. And obviously, army was like trying to consolidate their power. So no, they're doing things. So they are yeah. going against the communists. They are going against the, you know, any kind of idea about multi-party, political, you know, institutes. And then, you know, and then it looks like, you know, they have to find something else as well. And the yeah. something else is by 1982 is Rohingya people. Quite often the military has, has said, the Tatmadaw has said that they maintain the stability of the country. So mm. they needed a conflict because otherwise, you know, mm. Mm. they didn't have someone to blame for their, quite, quite often, uh, I think they, the, the country was mismanaged. Uh, and economically, people weren't very well. The Burmese people, uh, throughout the throughout the like um, since 1962, so they needed all of um, this uh, narrative to justify mm-hmm. their and to like deflect the attention from oh look this is what I, what's actually happening. But it's because we are trying to maintain the situation under control because look what the Rohingya people are mm. doing this and this and that. Mm. Mm. Politically, I think there's another thing um, more or less helped army regime from 1962. Because 1961, we saw like this, like, you know, this idea about non-aligned movement. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. like, Myanmar joined with that movement. Uh, so mm-hmm. like, like Nehru, Nasser, Sukarno, Tito, Nakruma, mm-hmm. so all those people, the good people, united yeah and said that, you know, we'll be neither East nor West, we'll not be part of Soviet Union, not be part of America, we'll be mm-hmm. non-aligned and we stick together. We are global South, third world. And, you know, uh, so I think that helped them to get away from, you know, extreme interest from America or from Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Uh, also that helped, you know, like this Chinese intervention that much in the like 60s, 70s, even 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, that position more or less helped, especially this army rule, uh, because they, can, they, they could play that card. You know, we are non-aligned movements, don't interfere with us. Yeah. We've got lots of good friends around us. Um, mm-hmm. If you see like, no, if you look at all those historical pictures, you can see like Nevin was visiting, you know, India, uh, like I mean, Indira Gandhi, then her father, Nehru, so, I mean, he was traveling all over the places around the world you know, as a kind of you know, non-aligned movement, Either. one of the leaders there. Um, but I think in terms of the Myanmarese people, mm-hmm. I think my understanding is like when a country is ruled by this brutal dictator for some time, 20 yeah. years, 30 years, I think that created lots of problems for the, even the people's mental well-being. People could not think properly. Yeah, like... So, Sometimes they, they became like more in a survival mode, you know, how they, they can survive. That's more important than anything else. So like when they're told that, you know, I'll not touch you, but I'll touch Rohingya, you know, uh, which one? Yeah. Is, yeah, go for Rohingya. And we both, you know, did quite a bit of research. We, we did not see any kind of protest march against this, you know, stripping off Rohingya from citizenship in 1982. But I mean, that's, that's the environment it, 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 it can create when yeah. it is ruled by this very brutal dictatorship for such a long time. Obviously, po- poverty played a big role in this whole thing that you, you've just mentioned, when people are just happy that they aren't themselves targeted by the military regime and they get on with their life as well as they can. Mm-hmm. However, you know, just a couple of years later in 1988, protests started uh, because, I don't know, the economic mismanagement of the country, people suffering, um, being one of the poorest country in the world, mm. have led people to protest. To, um, like students have joined the protests as well as monks um, in 1988, um, which I think is a very, uh, very powerful event. Uh, that says that gives uh, out to the military a very important message that people will not will not continuously um, endure the 
um, treatment of the military regime and their mistakes. Mm. And they are willing to, to take action in their own hands. Mm. Um, like a couple of things were happening. So obviously, Nevin was protected externally by this non-aligned movement. He, he was getting old as well, isn't he? So, so by 1988, he's, he's, he's pretty, pretty old by that time. And then yeah. more or less, that's the time when like on Suki, throughout her career, she was in Oxford, she was in New York. She got mm-hmm. married to you know, a British scholar. Uh, so she was, she was, no, not in the mainstream Myanmar politics. But 1988 also opened the opportunity because she was uh, going back to see her mother because her mother was very ill. Yeah, and she joined the process. Um, yeah, the timing. And- so, you know, so the lots of timing, isn't it? So the mm-hmm. non-aligned movement almost, you know, kind of by 1988, 89, we are talking about, you know, this is the collapse of the Soviet Union is coming. I think that around the world, this idea about, you know, again, the people's power, the people's idea about self-determination. Mm-hmm. I think you saw it everywhere in the Eastern Europe, in Africa, lots of places, these things are coming out. Uh, so the, yeah. the Soviet Union will collapse and then, you know, the, the new world order will create. So I think, I think that also touched Myanmar as well. I still remember like when I was growing up in Bangladesh, I was very young in the early nineties. So that's the time where, you know, things were happening around the world. And that touched also in Bangladesh, Bangladesh was ruled by army rule during that time. And like mm-hmm. by the 1991, that's the last time army was there. And that's the end mm-hmm. of army rule. And then we, we had some kind of you know, democratic process, but Myanmar was not that lucky. No, no, because despite the, despite the protests and the involvement of Aung San Suu Kyi and her endeavors in, in trying to um, present to the population the ideals such as democracy and human rights, um, I think she did a very interesting speech uh, at the time with the students. Um, it did have an effect because we had the elections in 1990. She became the one of the figures associated with the National League for Democracy, mm, mm. who won basically the elections in the 1990s. You know? mm, mm. Because I think Army took the opportunity because obviously this movement created lots of chaos on the ground. Yeah. Uh, things were bad in the periphery as well with all those groups fighting uh, mm-hmm. against the central government over the years. So that problem is still there. And then this like mass movement started. And then Aung San Suu Kyi was there. Some kind of leadership is there. Good leadership, we can call it. Um, yeah. So army was in a kind of totally... In a, in a kind of backseat. My understanding is um, because army was looking for a stop this mass movement. Whatever you guys want, you can have the election and then yes. you can rule the country. Just yeah. stop this mass movement. This is trying mm-hmm. all those you know, civil protest or like civil disobedience uh, because, you know, we have got to do things because there are problems mm-hmm. in the periphery. So we have got to stop this. Uh, so things you want, you'll get it. And I think that's the bait more or less on Sun Suki too, because the, she asked people to stop those, you know, movement. People came down, people all went home and then went for the election. And then they got that victory. But the, by the time, because since all went home, army was on the, <laughs> yeah. on the ground. And then they came back again very easily because there's no one there in the street. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, they, I think, I think then by 1992, more or less, they consolidated proper power again. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I think the, the Burma Socialist Party program was basically abolished in the 1988 when the protest started. And mm-hmm. the State Law and Order Restoration Council, which was basically the same thing, uh, uh, was founded. And then it only lasted until 1997. And then it was again re- replaced by the State Peace and Development Council, Council, which was again the same thing, 
the same people, more or less. When you look at the people running the parties and, you know, you find the same people, more or less, or, you know, various generations of the old military. So if you look at the behind the scene, that guy, I think, what was his name? The, the second general who came since 1992. And he has been there up to 2011. Yeah. That's a long haul, isn't it? 20, how many years? 20 years, isn't it? More or less, yeah. And then two things are really interesting because I mean obviously we knew that Myanmar's serious problem with their you know the social equality, the problem with the you know highest kind of poverty level, unemployment rate, and these are like seriously bad situation in Myanmar. But at the same time, the first army general Ne Win, um, I think last time I checked, I mean his family's net worth is like four four billion dollar. And the okay. second general who came in 1992 and stayed up to 2011, during yeah. 2007 or 8, his grandson actually put a bid for Manchester United Club with $1 billion. Yeah. So the, so the question is then, you know, how the hell did grandson got this $1 billion? I think we all know the answer. I, I think we need to check, like when they moved there, capital city from you know Yangon to, to other place. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like for the army because they thought that you know Yangon is too crowded and too many uh, poor people. So just like you know build a new new country, new capital just for them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a kind of you know business class. Um, and if you see if you just do a Google search with that you know, new capital city, uh, I think it's mm -hmm. not do. Um, yeah, yeah. You can see it, is, is, it looks very good, very posh. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> the dream is to become Dubai, you know? So the army became more ambitious, isn't it, over the years? So they, they feel that, yeah, you know, that uh, we can control the people, you know, we have got yeah. power, we, we, we can do things. And also, also, we can maximize our position as well. Yeah, I think I think the the popular protests have like pushed the military towards you know uh, taking a in a way more firmer stance, but at the same time you know try and make little changes so it seems different, even though it was the same thing. Mm. Um, mm. But it they only like people people people. Um, I think when it like in time, they all. Uh, came back uh, out on the streets to because the problems that were there to solve they were never solved. Maybe you know, for a couple of years things will run smooth smoothly, but then on the long term people would still struggle. Mm, mm. But also I think you know any kind of dictator, like whether military dictator or a political dictator, I think they have got some kind of expiry date as well. <laughs> Because they, okay. yeah. they do so much, you know, bad things in the society. You know, it has got a limit, and then, you know, at one point, people say that, "Oh, you know what? I just cannot take it anymore." Um, and then I think that that created this like two thousand. Is it two thousand eight when all the monks came out in the street? I yeah. think two thousand and seven, two thousand eight, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, uh, the the Safran Revolution. So these like uh, yeah. the monks came to the street. Um, um, yeah. that's, I mean, whenever, you no know, people come to the street is always a sign that, you know, people are not happy with like lots of things, yeah. uh, people yeah. want change because it's just, yeah. unbearable. it's just unbearable. I mean, you can see this like Black Lives Matter movement. You can see like when people coming out the street, it is, it, is, is that position that you just cannot take it anymore. Um, and you can see like one of the slogans from the BLM movement is like, you know, I cannot breathe. Uh, so just, you know, people thought by 2008 that they just could not breathe anymore, you know? And what yeah. the hell on? You know, this like, so we are talking about this like serious cyclone happened, something called yeah. Margis cyclone. And yeah. like, Ranson was bidding for Manchester United, you know? Obviously, the country wasn't rich enough for itself, but it had... Uh, citizens that could, you know, happen to have a billion dollars. Uh, but also I think it is important to take, as you mentioned, the cycle Nargis, 
uh, I think within two days, uh, the military organized a um, referendum to try and get approved the 2008 constitution, where they actually, they, they, they basically maintained power um, in the soon to come democratic Myanmar, you know. Um, so yeah, they, they didn't wait long uh, until they asked people to come to cast a vote. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? The people who hold power, who, who have been holding power for a long time, even the small sacrifice was very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. So when the Narg is happening, Saffron movement started, you know, people are on the street, and then they come up with this idea that, okay, let's have a referendum and then we'll do some of the constitutional change. If you saw the changes they did, it was so minuscule, so small, you know, it's like you know, the, the world's smallest violin they're playing that, you know, yeah, we did the change, man, accept it. We're going for a democratic country. <laughs> you know, we're starting the transition. Uh, so that's like 2008, by the time some kind of, you know, some kind of, you know, we are talking about democracy, the election, multi-party election. That will happen in 2015. So that's another seven years by the time we'll be gone. Yeah. And like in 2015, there was election, multi-party election. And then mm -hmm. Arby was saying that still that, do you know what? Yeah, do you know, 25% of the seats in the parliament will be controlled by us. Yeah, yeah. That means they have got default veto power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, you know, the army is more or less there. Yeah. And also on the top of that, they said, you know what? We want a couple of ministerial positions as well, the home office, the border yeah. <laughs> condition as well. That you know, if they sense that countries you know is not doing well or there is a problem with their security, they can mm -hmm. always come back. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see to see because uh, since I think 2011, we can talk about, you know, the Myanmar's transition to democracy. And they've always said that, yeah, we have multi-party elections, look. And I think in 2011, there were 95 political parties registered, uh, but only seven of them secured seats in the parliament. And in 2015, there were um, 20, 20 parties managed to secure seats in the parliament. But obviously you had the NND who had the majority. Then you had the USDP, the, uh, the military party that had the second largest number of seats. And then the rest 18 parties had each one seat. So, you know, when you're talking about multi-party elections and representation to have mm. that sort of numbers, I think it says it all. Mm. I mean, so obviously the military was under serious pressure to- Yeah. Yeah. open up or yeah. just just like you know go away mm -hmm. they are they're not going away anywhere and mm -hmm. so you know so like this is a serious achievement by on san you know so obviously she got another two landslide victory in 2015 and 2020 mm -hmm. yeah. so had that you know the earliest victory in 1990 um, so i mean she did well in terms of you know her political career it looks like yeah. she's well respected by her own people. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Again, like you know, so we are talking about this is the daughter of the founding father of the country, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. a very mm -hmm. powerful family, and yeah. and on the uh, way army behaved with her, so obviously they you know, put her on like the house arrest for like you know. Uh, I mean, so obviously the army did not do any kind of you know physical, you know, torture. Oh, or, yeah, but. You know, the army managed to contain her for a long time. No, 10, 15, 20 years, something like that, which is... It's a long haul, isn't it? I mean, it shows in the, how much power they kind of, you know, consolidated. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they could maneuver, you know, if, if there is yeah. a weakness there, they can move to another, another way. Uh, even like with the 2000, I think it's, that's the 2008 constitution. If you have got a dual citizenship in the family, then he cannot be the president of this country. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that is true. Because basically, basically Aston Suki, because she was married to, to a British person. Basically for her, isn't it? Yeah. So but they that, created a position for her, more or less, as a state chancellor, you know, which gave her, she's basically the de facto leader 
of the country. It's just she can't be the person. Like, I mean, how many barriers you will create? As many as they can. Like the road to democracy, brutal, isn't it? Of course. Yeah. Oh, brutal. Uh, just unbelievable brutality. It's, it's violence, isn't it? It's violence against the whole country for, yeah, I think it's... 50, years, for 50 years. And then they gave this kind of a small break to Aung San Suu Kyi. And then, you know, last February, they came back with full force again. And they said, no, sorry, you know. Yeah. So we're just taking a bit of break. And then we found that, you know, things are not going well. Not in our, yeah. so, you know. Yeah. So our perspective about the world is a bit different from your perspective. And yeah, yeah. Mullah's army came back with full force again. So this is the third general. Um, yeah, and uh, now. Um, so we are where we are now. And then, and then people are again coming back to the street again. Yeah, and I think that says a lot about the relationship. Uh, it's such a the, long, the long, distraught journey, isn't it? Against the British, yeah. rule, the Japanese rule, then Nevin, then another general. And then another general, you know, it's like three, four generation. Yeah, yeah, it's it's shocking. Uh, and now, but like, in a way, you see how, uh, like, to the Burmese people, especially, and to Myanmar, I think Aung San Suu Kyi is a national hero, and you can see that because people are on the streets, uh, and they they condemn the actions of the military, and they want their leader back. Um, which I think is, you know, the, the, the amount of support and she gets from people, I think it's, it's invaluable. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, I still kind of respect for Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, obviously her role with the Rohingya people is, 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 is a serious black spot in her career. And I think if she comes back, hope she, she you know, she will, she will apologize to the Rohingya people. And the yeah. she more or less, you know, initiated. Uh, and the way she was defending the army in the International Court of Justice, that will keep her very, very, you know, vulnerable. Uh, yeah. Look at the... And the protest march, and the people are saying that, you know, in the placard, they're saying that, you know, we apologize to the Rohingya people, we made mistakes. So the yeah. future country will create, everyone will be included. Mm -hmm. She would, she is just another politician at the, end of, at the end of the day. So she didn't want to lose the, the support of the Burmese majority just for the sake of, you know, mm. an ethnic minority, because her, her career would have, um, would have uh, had to suffer. Mm, mm. I, I think that tainted her, you know, as a kind of democratic leader. Um, no, definitely, definitely. No, it's part of her became totally, you know, nationalist, isn't it? Uh, yeah, she was with the elite, basically. Mm -hmm. She was part of the elite. Like 90% people are actually, you know, this Bamar population. So like took yeah, sides. Exactly. And then, you know, so like she almost like mimicked the army rule, basically, what whatever army did over the years, mm -hmm. she more or less yeah. played the same game, played the same game. Yeah. Uh, um, but at the same time, you know, what else she could have done? Um, yeah. If you if you if you we if you want to give her benefit of doubt, first mm -hmm. she did it uh, so that you know she could manage the army a bit, and then and the hope is eventually she could get rid of the army altogether. That's a very tainted position, like from that position to come back and then say nice to, nice thing to the Rohingya people that, no, sorry, no, I did it just for, you know, it's a kind of game. So, you know. Yeah. It would be interesting to see if, if she would change um, her discourse and she would acknowledge the atrocities uh, that the military regime had committed towards the Rohingya rather than just, she's been silent about it since, ever since she came into power. Mm. Um, so it would be very interesting to see whether or not now mm. 
she would change her. I think like, no, the future of Myanmar has to be without Aung San Suu Kyi. Right. Aung San, with Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, mm -hmm. because she carries a history and that history was tainted. You no know, three finger slogan they, they are saying. Yes. That, you know? So this, 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 this is the sign for, you know, it's a fight against inequality. It's a fight against brutal, brutal rulers. Then, you know, in that equation, yeah. Yeah. Aung San Suu Kyi doesn't fit in. It is of course, but yeah, I'm like, um, it would be interesting to see if there will be other emerging leaders that would, you know, continue mm. this, this, um, this fight and have enough, have it, like, obviously, when you, when you, when you look at the people, um, they are fighting for her at the moment, in a way, you know, they, they are, they are denouncing the military's action, they, they are denouncing the fact that she's been imprisoned once again. Um, mm. I think, I think it would be difficult to find someone that would, um, basically replace her in a way mm -hmm. because she mm -hmm. has the she has a big like a lot of history and also she's she's the daughter of the of the architect mm -hmm. of Burma mm -hmm. because i mean her background and the persona is so mm -hmm. big be really difficult to have another leadership while she's alive exactly yeah yeah i'm not saying that you know that she's now old she's like 70 yeah. She's something in yeah. her 70s. Um, so, you know, even the democratic leaders also retire. It's not only the army retire. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, um, but I think this will be difficult. If she comes back, this will be difficult for her, definitely. Oh, yeah. 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 Because the whole discourse will be changed. That this is a serious lesson that, you know, you did the thing what army wanted you to do over the years. It never worked. It never worked. Mm -hmm. They do the same mistake again. And then this is just like cycle, isn't it? Yeah, but now, but now you know, the, the coup basically reunited in a way um, the people, because now the Rohingya people themselves, Rohingya activists are denouncing the coup. And they say, they say that we are standing together with the Burmese majority against, the, uh, against this, these, uh, the acts of the military. So it brings people together. Maybe this will they will contribute to Anton Suu Kyi's um, change in her in her in her stance mm. because people are no longer as divided. Mm. But for a long time, no one would no one would really accept talking about the Rohingya in any way, mm. in a, in a, in any nice way, mm. you know. Mm. Um, but now people are they seem willing to change. Um, mm. We talked quite a bit. I mean, one last thing I want to just like, you know, touch a bit is this like three fingers movement. Yeah. yeah. So it was in Thailand, you know, they're doing the same thing in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah. In India, there's the farmers protest. So lots of things happening around that part of the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you never know, you know, like the things we saw like with Arab Spring started in like Tunisia and then suddenly, yeah. you know, bushfire and started and then yeah. so I mean uh, I mean yeah. the China has to be careful um, and the rest of the world you know because th these are the places also you know the cheap lever <laughs> for the <laughs> yeah yeah definitely so like it, it gives me so much hope to see that you know mm. this country somehow came together and with something so so small but you know, there there's sign that there will hopefully will be change, you know, and there will change, and and there is space for like an inclusive society and mm. democracy, the way we mm. think of democracy. But I think from that point of view, I think I'm expecting some kind of you know compromise position. Mm -hmm. um, yeah current, you know, this like deadlock situation with the army in power and then things like they're saying that there'll be election. I think there is a good chance that army will actually back off 
um, that that I'm I'm kind of more or less optimistic because the other options are much more dangerous options mm-hmm. for the whole world, uh, yeah. for the whole world, the, the capitalistic world. You know, yeah. because, you know, this like three fingers movement can create serious kind of you know serious yeah. social upheaval. Yeah, I think popular uh, public disobedience. Yeah, so I think that's like much right. more option. The the safe option is army. You know, you don't want to go go back to the barrack. You want to stay a bit of you know more time here. Stay here, you know, one year. Yeah, and then go for election, and then you know, go back to the barrack. I think the more problem area is that who will lead the future Myanmar? Is it Aung San Suu Kyi again, or or that she or she will just you know. Um, because I mean, so far, I remember if you look at her like in the 80s, 90s, um, I mean, she's a decent person. She's, a, you know, so hope, you know, she'll just tell that, you know what, um, I've done my part. Um, so that's the optimistic position that she will tell her supporters and the public in Myanmar that, you know, I will retire and then I will make a space for the future leadership. And then I think that will be the, the serious good start for the Myanmar that they were supposed to start in 1948. Yeah. What's your last thought? Then we'll stop here. <laughs> My last thought. I, I really hope, uh, regardless of who's going to be the new leader of Myanmar, I'm really hoping that they will, uh, they will try and build a more inclusive society and they will address the issues that have been ignored for so for such a long time and i really hope that uh, you know uh, the whole the whole dynamic of the of the country will change to the benefit of everybody really okay so with that positive note i mean we can con- yeah yeah i think we, i think we should focus on the on the positive side of things uh, and on a positive note. I, I think the one, one last thing, because I mean, always I tend to do in my podcast is ask my guests that, you know, because I mean, the, the people who come to this podcast are more or less, you know, are successful in their careers. Um, or if, if it is a student, are successful in their, you know, student life. So you did well in your undergraduate, you did well in your master's. Uh, you're going for a PhD, you're applying for lots of good things. Um, what will be your advice for the for the current undergrad students to any university in the world? Uh, be open-minded, uh, work as hard as you can, and try and find your own way, really. Try and find your own voice. Good. And use it, obviously. <laughs> So can you say that like fortune favors the brave? No, be brave. <laughs> challenge your teachers, challenge your professors, no? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, that's very important. Mm, good. Thank you, Robota. We did not prepare anything for this session. This is a totally unscripted <laughs> session, but we covered quite a bit, you know, so like more storytelling, uh, so more kind of... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that, you know, that anyone can, if, if they had have make some time and listen to this podcast, they will they'll not learn some good things about Myanmar and, uh, and the future trajectory. Hopefully. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Abdullah.